Uh, good evening. I'm Mike Perry. I'm the executive director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. Uh, we are the 501c3 organization that supports the development and programs at the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center here at the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. It's our privilege tonight to host General David Petraeus uh, for tonight's uh, webinar. Uh, I would like now to introduce Dr. Conrad Crane, the Chief of Historical Services at the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, uh, to introduce our speaker and to manage the questions. We've already obtained questions from many in the audience, uh, and Dr. Crane will pass them uh, over to uh, General Petraeus. Uh, I'll monitor chat, but we will not actively use either the question or answers or the chat rooms. So thank you. Con? Thank you, Mike. Uh, as most of you all know out there, General David Petraeus is widely recognized for his inspirational leadership in many venues. Over his 37 years of Army service, he led units in Europe, Central America, the United States, Haiti, Bosnia, Kuwait, Iraq, Afghanistan, the greater Middle East, and Central Asia. His career culminated with six consecutive commands as a general officer, five of which were in combat, a record believed unmatched in the post-World War II era. After his retirement from the Army, he went on to be the director of the CIA and is now a partner with KKR and the chairman of the KKR Global Institute. I mean, I could go through a list of all his other awards and recognitions. He was a runner-up for Time Magazine's Person of the Year. He's been named one of America's 25 best leaders. He's got a myriad of military awards, civilian awards. Um, he's got a PhD from Princeton. Uh, of course, though, the roots of his accomplishments really come from being exposed to classmates like Mike Perry and myself at West Point back in his younger days. We all graduated there in 1974, a long time ago. For you in the audience, you're in for a real treat tonight, though. Uh, General Petraeus is going to talk about a number of things that really haven't been talked about before. It's a lot of new information on Afghanistan. He's going to benefit us all with his, with his observations on his couple of decades, really, of experience with the troublesome spot we call Afghanistan. Uh, so let me start off with his first exposure to this lovely place. Um, General Petraeus, uh, your first trip to Afghanistan occurred on your way home from your tour as commander of the Multinational Security Transition Command in Iraq in 2005. What points did you emphasize in your briefing to Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld after your visit? Well, thanks, Con. Uh, it's great to be with you, reunited with you, and thanks again for what you did in 2006 uh, to help bring the counterinsurgency field manual uh, into fruition and publication as its editor-in-chief with a great team uh, out at Leavenworth and also at Quantico. Uh, and, and Mike, thanks for the uh, invitation. Thanks for what you're doing with the U.S. Army uh, Heritage and Education Center and your leadership of it. Uh, and thanks to all those who have joined us this evening. One I note is even from Australia, uh, clearly gets an award for uh, either getting up early in the morning or whatever <laughs> time it might be down there. Um, yeah, the first encounter with Afghanistan on the ground was actually on my way home from a three-star tour in Iraq. Um, and you may recall that I've been in Iraq as a two-star uh, division commander of the 101st Airborne Division for the invasion the first year came home, was sent back within a couple of months to do an assessment of the security forces who had done very relatively poorly in March uprisings of 2004, except actually in our old area. Uh, came back, reported out to Secretary Rumsfeld. Uh, he said, great, good recommendations. Uh, now go back to Fort Campbell, change out and go back to Iraq and implement them. And so that was another tour that ended up being a 15 and a half month tour. Uh, at the end of which I was pretty keen to get home, needless to say, he came out a week or so before I was going to go home and said, hey, uh, you know, good work out here. I'd like you to come home through Afghanistan. Um, and I pointed out that wasn't the direct route between Iraq and Washington, D.C., where my family was. But uh, so we took a team and went over there, a team of folks who had been involved in the training and equip mission uh, in Iraq, uh, and spent about a week or so there and developed a series of recommendations. Uh, General Eikenberry was the commander there on the ground uh, at the time. Of course, later would be the ambassador there. 
uh, Ambassador Ron Newman, uh, whose dad had actually been the ambassador in Afghanistan, was the ambassador at that time. A uh, lot of good meetings with them, with their efforts to train the military, the army, really, and the police. Um, and <clears throat> came back and sat down with Secretary Rumsfeld. And the first slide of that briefing was titled, Afghanistan does not equal Iraq, and laid out all of the different items in which you could compare and contrast countries. But the differences were hugely profound. Um, one country could generate $100 billion in oil revenue. The other could barely generate, a, at that time, a few hundred million, and probably some kind of customs revenue or modest taxes or something like that. One was very literate. The other was not. One had great infrastructure. The other had none. One had a history of strong central government. The other didn't. Uh, one had an enemy largely inside its country, Afghanistan, of course, and perhaps the most significant and challenging aspect of the country was at the headquarters of the entities that were beginning to make life difficult. Of course, this was still, this is now September 2005. You're just starting to see the Taliban, who had been shattered, of course, uh, in late 2001 when we went in there, retreated to uh, Pakistan, then gradually reconnected gradually put their foot in the water, came back out, and, and they were starting to reestablish uh, infrastructure inside <clears throat> Afghanistan at that time. The problem already clearly was that the Taliban leadership, it was called the Quetta Shura for a reason, it's in Quetta and Balochistan uh, of Pakistan, uh, and well-known North Waziristan, the heart of darkness, was one of the areas in the tribal uh, areas of Pakistan and was the home to Al Qaeda, to the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, the Haqqani network, a very, very challenging, uh, challenging organization for security in Afghanistan, and a handful of the others uh, that were gradually regrouping that had been active uh, in Afghanistan prior to that. So that was a very significant, uh, if you will, I, and it's something that stayed with me, and we'll come back to that again and again. Um, there were a number of issues with the training itself, uh, and obviously I'd sat down with, uh, if you will, my counterpart there. There was a two-star uh, general who was running this from the Air Force, and having spent 15 and a half months building that in Iraq with very considerable resources, um, you know, you could identify stuff jumped off the training schedule at you, and the police, for example, I think it was a six-week uh, course of training or thereabouts, uh, and and I kept looking at the schedule. I knew there's something missing, and I finally realized that they weren't shooting ever at all in the entire course. And you know, and I asked, look, these it was a contract run operation, not military run. Uh, and I said, my gosh, these guys are going to go out into an ins counter and insurgency, uh, and they're not getting any time on the range. And there was some explanation while well, we. It takes a long time to get to it. I said, you could do a 25 meter range if you have to. But uh, the bottom line was they had marching on the schedule for an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening and no shooting ever at all. And the marching, I said, what are you, know, are you trying to create the old guard of police here or what's your objective? <laughs> so there were some real issues. And then the big issue on the army side was that the metric on which they focused was number of soldiers trained rather than present for duty. Uh, and actually, as we dug into the math, having had to dig really hard in the math and the metrics and all these readiness that we were already working on uh, in Iraq and had been wire brushed a couple of times by uh, various congressional delegations, um, it turned out that when you actually looked at who was actually present for duty and the retention rate, they were actually losing ground rather than making ground. But if you focused on how many were trained, it looked really good. Um, so again, there are some pretty big issues there. And again, they took them all to heart. Uh, General Eikenberry was very grateful. Um, and I you know, reported those out to, to the secretary. But again, the big issue uh, was the enormous differences between those two countries. Keeping in mind, of course, that Secretary Rumsfeld had been riveted on Iraq ever since uh, say really probably late 2002, but certainly from March 2003 onward that when we did the invasion. Uh, I mean, I was getting a weekly video teleconference uh, 
uh, with the Secretary of Defense, I think I had it for the first three months that I was the three star uh, in Iraq as we stood up this multinational security transition command headquarters and its units for the army and police and all the other elements of it and then tried to help them rebuild uh, and, and so forth with enormous resources. Um, and it was very clear that the Afghanistan uh, effort had not had anywhere near that kind of focus. I, I mean, that focus was so intense that I likened it to having a, you know, once again, going through my PhD uh, dissertation defense or something like that <laughs> on a weekly basis for an hour a week. Yeah, I still have uh, PTSD over my PhD defense, so <laughs> I, I know how that goes. Um, while you were still commander of the surge in Iraq, uh, but after you were selected to be the commander of U.S. Central Command, you flew out to a U.S. aircraft carrier off the southern coast of Pakistan for a meeting hosted by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mullen, for, uh, for the Pakistani Chief of Army Staff, General Kayani, and his operations chief, Major General Pasha. Also present was Commander of U.S. SOCOM, Admiral Olson. What was the point of that particular meeting? Well, it was pretty clear. <clears throat> and again, I'd already been selected for Central Command. I think I might have been confirmed by then. I, I don't recall. Uh, but they wanted me to be part of an initiative that Admiral o uh, Mullen was really going to be the one pushing, but would involve Central Command Commander very significantly uh, to work with the Pakistanis, build a relationship, um, actually share lessons from what we'd done in Iraq. Uh, in fact, I remember I presented him the counterinsurgency field manual with some nice inscription on it. Uh, by the way, keep in mind that even though there is a chairman of the Joint Chiefs in Pakistan, the chief of army staff is the senior military figure, period. Um, and <clears throat> the, the chairman is almost a uh, figurehead position by comparison. The power in certain respects in the country overall, but absolutely in the military, it is the chief of army staff. And keep in mind that the intelligence services, if you will, the CIA of Pakistan is really the inter-services intelligence, ISI, which is underneath the chief of army staff as well. In fact, General Pasha, by the time I was CIA director, would become the DG director general of ISI. Uh, so I had a lot of experience with him and with General Kiani uh, over the years. So the hope was that there could be a more productive relationship uh, with Pakistan. Uh, this was while the Bush administration was still in office. This is, of course, now probably the summer of 2008, late summer. Um, but already looking ahead uh, to the fact that whomever the next president was, because the election hadn't yet been held, but whomever was elected was clearly going to focus more on Afghanistan. You may recall Admiral Mullen often used to, to observe, almost perhaps lament, uh, that in Iraq we do what we must, in Afghanistan we do what we can. Uh, and now we had a situation where all the surge forces had been drawn down in Iraq, uh, we had a way forward there. Violence was down by 85 um, percent, and it, and we built up the Iraqi security forces. They were capable. They were taking over. Uh, the institutions were were really quite robust. Uh, hadn't had all the political progress that we'd wanted, clearly, but again, very very substantial progress uh, during the time that Ambassador Crocker and I were privileged to be together as the head of the surge. Um, so that was the hope. We'd build this relationship. Uh, we were going to do a lot more for them. And of course, if you then go on to the Obama administration, uh, early on, uh, President Obama, who of course ran for office saying that Afghanistan was the war of necessity, Iraq mm -hmm. was the war of choice. So very clearly going to pivot uh, his focus as well, made possible really, again, by the surge in Iraq. And he would, of course, select Ambassador Holbrook. Uh, he would be in overall on the diplomatic side for Afghanistan and Pakistan. He'd build a coalition of the willing for this and individuals and boys from the different countries. Um, and as the central command commander, uh, obviously I would be in a sense his military counterpart, although having 21 countries rather than just two. So that was the hope. And it was a very, very good meeting. Um, a wonderful, you know, sort of 
bonding effort and um, a real introduction to the issues because it was many hours. Um, I, I believe we stayed overnight. Um, I'd flown out there from, I guess, Cutter or somewhere on a COD, the uh, propeller driven aircraft. And I think General Kiani came out either on a helicopter or perhaps on a COD as well. Um, so that was the beginning. And, and of course, Admiral Mullen put a great deal of effort into that particular relationship, a huge amount. Uh, I remember the dozens of meetings that he had. And I also had dozens of meetings. We were, we were, we sought to complement each other uh, and to constantly sharing on that particular relationship uh, in particular. Uh, obviously, you had a, a three or four star in, I guess, a four star by then in Afghanistan uh, as the overall commander, the US commander. Um, and so he's got that country. The key is what can we get Pakistan to do? noting that the enemy forces, again, are on their soil, at least the headquarters, and that if we're ever really to put pressure, especially if we ever want to put pressure to achieve some kind of diplomatic uh, negotiation, then it, they can't have that sanctuary uh, to which they can retreat. They've got to be pressured there as well. Keeping in mind, of course, in Iraq, we'd been able to pressure virtually all of the elements uh, that were on the battlefield. There, were, there was a facilitation through Syria for Sunni uh, insurgents and indeed suicide bombers, but not big headquarters there. And certainly Iran was supporting the Shia militia. Uh, but again, the headquarters were in Iraq and we could pressure them in there. And so we needed to do that outside Afghanistan, given that unique situation that I laid out, that there was the most important difference between the two countries, which is again, the presence of sanctuaries for the enemies we were fighting beyond our reach, keeping in mind that, of course, it's very limited what we were able to do at that time. Uh, really, on the military side, there was very, very little that could be done in Pakistan. And I think there was one operation ultimately carried out, publicly known, um, when I was a CENTCOM commander uh, very early on, I believe, or perhaps even before by Admiral McRaven's forces, and I think that was literally the last one we did until the uh, Osama bin Laden raid. So, so how did the relationship between the U.S. and Pakistan and yourself and General Kiani evolve during your time as commander of Central Command? <clears throat> there was a very encouraging beginning. Um, I remember going, of course, to uh, Central Command, took command in October of 2008. Uh, the first trip, I'm pretty sure, went out to Afghanistan and Pakistan. That would be the natural one. I obviously knew Iraq. This is the other war. Uh, and I recall going out there and again, of course, meeting again uh, in Afghanistan and then also uh, in Pakistan. And, and then, of course, the Obama administration comes in. Uh, there's the uh, very early study uh, that is done, uh, headed by uh, an individual from Brookings, uh, the Rydell Report. Um, and then uh, headed by Bruce Rydell, a career CIA officer. Um, that resulted in a, an initial tens of thousands of additional forces to Afghanistan, or thereabouts, a little bit less than that, probably. Uh, and then, of course, the big emphasis to get the AFPAC uh, initiative going with Richard Holbrook driving this as only he, he could. I, you know, his nickname was the bulldozer for a reason, and I think he liked that nickname, in fact, and sought to live up to it. And it was great to be his military wingman for that. Um, a key element, again, was what will the Pakistanis do? Um, and indeed, in 2008 uh, was sort of a golden year. Um, or, I'm sorry, in 2009 was a golden year. Uh, in that year, the Pakistani army went on the offensive, but they went on the offensive really against the Tariki Taliban Pakistani, which is the Pakistan Taliban as opposed to the, the Taliban or the Afghan Taliban, the Quetta Shura Taliban, although there is some loose relationship between them, but one was really focused on Pakistan, the other focused on Afghanistan. And the Pakistani Taliban had taken control of many of these different areas uh, of the federal minister tribal area, in, including Swat Valley, which is a very uh, iconic place, really. It's sort of the summer vacation spot 
it's very high al altitude, snow stays there on the ground for a long time. I remember we made trips up there uh, a couple of times. And that is in a sense, almost like a dagger pointed at Islamabad, the capital of Pakistan. And so the Pakistani army mounted a very impressive campaign. And it had to be, in a sense, a combination of military and, or, or, or um, going after, in a sense, an army, but also a counterinsurgency campaign. Um, so it was not enough just to defeat the forces that were there. They then had to have all of the stability operations components that tend to uh, shape a counterinsurgency campaign and make it different from just a military offensive uh, without the rest of that. Um, and it was very skillfully carried out. Uh, really admirable stuff. I mean, they were doing air assaults at 10 and 11,000 feet and not the kind of uh, helicopters that we had. Uh, very tough landing zones, courageous actions. And they basically took SWAT, then they took Bajor, Momond, Khyber, uh, Oryxai, uh, and part of South Waziristan, and then here's North Waziristan, which is really, again, the location we were most intently focused on, keeping in mind that, of course, Quetta is all the way down here in Baluchistan. They, were, they weren't doing anything down there. And I later learned, General Kayani later told me that he had an agreement that they would not do any operations in Baluchistan other than continue to run the Staff College, which is in Quetta, and maintain the border. Uh, and that was because of concern over a Baluchi uh, insurgency or insurrection uh, if there was too much of a presence of the Pakistani army. That essentially eliminated any hope that we could get uh, coordination from them to go after uh, the Taliban, even though we had quite a good idea uh, of where Mullah Omar and uh, the headquarters were located. But this is a very impressive campaign, and it took the course of a full year. Uh, you may have some special forces officers in the audience who will, who perhaps actually were involved. We had advisor teams all the way down to brigade headquarters and brigade tactical command posts, which were tucked right up behind the battalion command posts of the Pakistani army. Uh, we were providing ISR for them. Uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance assets. Uh, we even often to refuel, offer to refuel their aircraft. We could slide our tankers, get them over into pocket because they have F-16s, which uh, again could be used for that. That they declined. Um, but it was a, an extraordinary amount of coordination. We helped them rebuild uh, or, or build, if you will, an in counterinsurgency school and center rebuild their special operations brigade which had been used as light infantry previously and got pretty beaten up um, and again it was very very impressive and i made a number of trips in there and would fly out over these locations and again the the mountains are extreme uh, the altitude is significant uh, the terrain is very very tough but they culminated so there was this very promising, and keep in mind on the diplomatic side, during that same year, Ambassador Holbrook and I went to Congress uh, and we got, <clears throat> I think it was some $7.5 uh, million, or billion dollars, uh, or 6.5 for economic assistance alone. It was 1.5 for a certain number of years. Uh, and that, you add to that another 1.5 or so that the military was giving to Pakistan uh, for uh, funds to defray the costs of our traffic going through them to uh, Afghanistan, a whole variety of different uh, funds that were provided, including, of course, the military education, international military education and training. Um, so again, it was a very, very encouraging year. There were these summit sessions that Ambassador Holbrook and I hosted uh, for everybody all the way up to Under Secretary of uh, State uh, and the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, actually the Deputy Secretary of State, I think it might have been Bill Burns at that time, was at these. Um, and all of the, the ambassadors and the commanders would come back. And again, there was a sense of real progress and then also convening the prime minister uh, of, uh, or the president of Afghanistan, President Karzai at the time, and also the president at that time was the power now as the prime minister uh, in Pakistan as well. And again, uh, and we would, so these were tripartite meetings, real hopes of coordination and so forth. Uh, as I said, 
it culminated on North Waziristan. And it wasn't, I don't think, that they truly didn't want to tangle with them as much as it was, I think they had culminated as an effective force. The casualties had been very substantial. Uh, they don't have the kind of ISR and precision strike assets and hellfires and all the rest that we do. Um, it's uh, a, a much more uh, less precise uh, would be uh, the, the term, at least uh, a lot of tube artillery and so forth. Uh, and just again, a lot of sort of short uh, infantry battles uh, rather than the kind of advantages that we could bring to bear uh, for our forces when they get into a tough situation. Um, and that took a while to set in that this was going to be it. There was still hope, certainly throughout the winter of 2008 and into nine. Certainly, still a lot of effort in that regard, and it continued. Um, but we were starting to get a sense that, that we're not sure we're going to be able to get them to go after these forces. And over time, it became uh, more apparent that there was a re real reluctance to do that. To be fair, North Waziristan is, again, all mountains and passes. And the border forces that are out there have to be resupplied through these different passes. And they can easily be shut down. Uh, you, they'll let you attack through those and then close down your lines of communication. And an army that doesn't have the kind of helicopters uh, that you have in the US military uh, has a very difficult time in a situation like that. OK. Um, during your confirmation hearing uh, to become uh, COM ISAF and COM US Forces Afghanistan, you cautioned the members of the Senate Armed Services Committee they should not expect to see in Afghanistan the dramatic progress with the surge in Iraq. Why did you offer that caution? Well, I'd offered that previously. This was a little bit more significant because now I was going to be the commander in Afghanistan. You know, it's one thing to do it as the, the boss of the commander, if you will, or the theater commander. But, you know, the one they're paying attention to, of course, is the, the individual who's commanding on the ground. I was going to be that individual. And frankly, uh, for the Iraq confirmation process, I had said, I believe that we can make significant progress with this strategy that we are going to implement. It's about 180 degrees different from what we've been doing. Um, we recognize that we have to go back into the neighborhoods. We have to live with the people. We have to do reconciliation. We're going to pursue the irreconcilables relentlessly, all of these elements. And I said, this, this can be done. Hard is not hopeless. Afghanistan, even though the level of violence was considerably less actually than say the level of violence uh, at the start of the surge in Iraq or several months into the surge, um, is just a much more difficult place. Uh, again, uh, we realized, remember General Caldwell was doing the train and equip mission, now it was a three-star mission, NATO training mission in Afghanistan. Uh, and, he, and he said, you know, we actually have to add, add reading and writing um, and numbers to basic training because we realized that we were giving these basic trainees and police and so forth that you know a beat a bolo list be on the lookout for this license plate and they can't actually read it uh, they can't give basic orders they can't so you know you're starting out at a level that is much much uh, more basic and again the infrastructure although that now had benefited you all had the ring road you had a lot of uh, base structure and so forth still uh, was very much less. And of course, at the end of the day, virtually no money compared with Iraq, which actually could pay for its own military, pay for a lot of social programs. If you came up with a good idea in Iraq for how to deal with those who had reconciled and we need training or education or uh, some other program, uh, the Iraqis actually had the wherewithal to do that. Afghanistan did not. So, uh, Beyond that, again, if you have sanctuaries outside the country and you can't put pressure on them, um, it's really, really hard to do what we did in Iraq, which was essentially, you know, you have a choice. Um, you can cast off these uh, extremists or insurgents uh, and throw your lot in with the new Afghanistan. Life will be better for you. You can reconcile what's called reintegration in Afghanistan. Reconciliation was the grand bargain with the insurgent leaders. 
Um, and that was what Ambassador Holbrook was pursuing. Um, or, you, you know, we're going to pursue you. Well, that's tougher. Certainly the rank and file by and large were in Afghanistan, but the senior leaders uh, would come in and, and, and go out. And if you really put pressure on, they again had a way of scurrying away, uh, although we got plenty of the leaders as well. Again, JSOC was extraordinary in Afghanistan as it was in, in Iraq. Um, now over time, we did drive the level of violence down year on year, uh, but this is nothing like the 85% reduction in violence that we had in Iraq, which was able to be sustained by Iraqi security forces and institutions and, and funded and so forth. So, you know, it's just looking at that. It was not caution. It was just, you know, honesty. It was reality. And I didn't want them to think because, you know, we were able to do this when I was privileged to be the commander that we're necessarily going to be able to do that at all. In fact, I said, we will not. Uh, be able to flip Afghanistan. I do think we can halt the momentum. I think we can push them back. I think we can continue to keep Al Qaeda from having a sanctuary. These are the missions given to us, uh, but we're not going to be able to drive violence down the way that we did in Iraq. Yeah, obviously you were doing a lot of managing of expectations with that particular briefing. Uh, I know back at the War College, it was always pretty, always difficult to try to figure out command and control relationships over there. Um, you know, the, the command relationship in Afghanistan, where you had a NATO ISAF hat, and a U.S. forces Afghanistan hat, was a lot different than uh, and more complex than the relatively straightforward command relationships you had uh, during the surge in Iraq. What challenges uh, did these arrangements in Afghanistan create that were not present in Iraq? Well, Iraq was pretty clean. At the end of the day, Iraq, Iraq was a U.S.-led multinational force. The chain of command was, again, very straightforward for the military commander. It was central command, uh, sec def through the chairman, obviously. Uh, on the diplomatic side, Ambassador Crocker really had the ability to go directly to the Secretary of State. And, of course, uh, the president was convening every single week, start at 7.30 in the morning on a Monday with his entire national security team around the table, a one-hour video conference with us. So, again, that... It was just very, very clear. Um, and of course, we were the predominant force far and away. The Brits had a good force, but again, nothing like, we had 165,000 American men and women in uniform over that number of contractors and civilians, uh, and then tens of thousands of coalition forces. Uh, in Afghanistan, it was 100,000 Americans at the height of the force level there, 50,000 uh, NATO and non-NATO partners, including, for example, Australia and some others. Um, so it's quite an important complement of forces there. Over 60 nations, uh, as I recall, coalition maintenance was a huge challenge. You had caveats with every single country there except for the United States. And what you had to do was identify the strengths of each contingent um, and then figure out how to, and also the shortcomings, the weaknesses. Uh, what they're missing, and then figure out how to, how to provide U.S. plugs, essentially, uh, that could make up for what was missing uh, and enable that, the strengths to be capitalized on as fully as we possibly could. So, but you had a dual chain of command, and, and you had different pressures from different ones. Obviously, you had to pay attention to both of them. What that also meant, which I think is often overlooked, is that I didn't have one diplomat. It wasn't the general and the ambassador. Um, I couldn't do that. Um, you know, first of all, there was a senior civilian rep from NATO. So he was my, in a fabulous one, the former British ambassador in Afghanistan was then, the, you know, I knew him then, now he's a senior civilian rep. By the way, now he's the national security advisor. Uh, of the UK and, and truly an extraordinary individual. Um, and then we had Ambassador Eikenberry, knew uh, Afghanistan very, very well. But, you know, you sort of either had to take both of them or, and then we had a, an additional problem, which was that Ambassador Eikenberry, as you may recall, sent a cable back. The last meeting of the, this process that resulted in the 30,000 additional US forces um, and it described President Karzai as an unsuitable partner and some other very pejorative descriptions. 
and it was dropped at every single place on the table and elsewhere, and it leaked. Not surprisingly, got back to President Karzai, and every time I'd take Ambassador Eikenberry in, if it was a small meeting um, where I might go as USFA with the US ambassador, um, he would at some point get into it um, and say, well, you're the one who called me unsuitable. And so ultimately that was a difficult relationship. Beyond that, if you think about it, we could not have a true civil military campaign plan the way we had in the multinational force in Iraq and the US embassy, because it couldn't just be signed by uh, me and the ambassador. Uh, it had to be signed by a whole bunch of people if it's going to be the overall campaign plan. So the overall campaign plan I had to do is comm ISAF. We had, I don't know, eight or 10 ambassadors of the largest countries that were sort of involved in that, but it was nowhere near the kind of unified effort. We actually did do a USFA, US campaign plan, yet another one, um, but it didn't encompass everything because of course uh, it, it wasn't over the whole effort. So it was actually quite complex. And you had the Secretary General uh, understandably pushing very hard for conditions for transition and all the rest of this. And, um, you know, and then you're there fighting. So, and you have meetings with them and you have meetings with them. And of course you've got 60 countries uh, worth of leaders coming in who want to spend time with you. All of which, again, that's, you welcome. Uh, I'm a strong believer in Churchill's uh, observation that the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without them. But it, it was not clean. It was much more complex. And it was already complex because of the enemy being outside mm -hmm. uh, and then the various other challenges that you had uh, inside Afghanistan uh, with a, an often fraught political situation as well. Yeah, and it, you said that our effort in Afghanistan didn't get the inputs right until late 2010. And I know that's a key point for you. What do you mean by that? Well, by inputs, what I'm talking about are the, first of all, the right big ideas. Uh, so again, essentially, you know, a, a civil military counterinsurgency campaign. Um, beyond that, it's the right level of forces. Uh, it's the right level of money. It's the right level of enablers, the ISR and all the others. Uh, it's the right people. Um, it's the right preparation of the forces. Um, and keep in mind that all of this came together in Iraq fairly early on. Uh, certainly it was by the time of the surge because we'd had multiple tours, some of us, and we'd gone back and we did the big ideas that are in the counterinsurgency field manual admittedly a general manual that you then had to apply for the context in Iraq or Afghanistan or what have you. And those were very, very different. And there were different components in some respects. You had to get the organizational architecture right. Keep in mind, we'd, we had not gotten that right from the very beginning. If you ever read Sean Naylor's Not a Good Day to Die yeah. about the early months uh, and you know how Tora Bora and the confusing structure where you have black soft, white soft, um, you bring in uh, the, the commander who just happens to be up in Kazakhstan because his division is committed in, is a two brigade division committed in Kosovo where they wouldn't let him put a flag and he couldn't be there. And then in Bosnia, actually where I was at that time. Um, so again, and it, and it kept evolving and it was always sort of in a state of evolution. And it wasn't really till Stan McChrystal came in, you have the, le the additional commitment you have a recognition that you have to have a U.S. forces Afghanistan because he has to be dual-headed, not just in sort of name, but he has to have the capabilities because there's a whole structure and missions and so forth, many of them very highly classified over here that are U.S. only. And you've got to have this uh, NATO uh, overarching structure as well. Um, so that's really what I'm getting at when I talk about the big ideas. And Stan certainly got all that going, uh, and he did that starting in the summer of, say, 2009, uh, and we had the long nine-meeting process with Ambassador, with uh, uh, President Obama, I think unparalleled in the amount of time that a president committed to just going through, and keep in mind, every one of those 
NFC meetings was pre that he chaired was preceded by a principal's committee, usually a deputies committee. I attended the principal's committee uh, as well. So an enormous effort on that over a period of months that culminate in the commitment of additional forces um, and resources and all the rest of that. And Stan's got that going. Um, and then of course, uh, leaves in the summer of 2010. Um, and, and I very thankfully inherit what he's got going, add a couple of additional pieces, the um, Afghan local police program, which was hugely needed, uh, a, an anti-corruption program with H.R. McMaster brought in to oversee that, a couple of others uh, for some other uh, areas, uh, and then the whole transition uh, intellectual approach and conditions and architecture and process. And by the way, Ashraf Ghani, now the president was my partner for that transition process uh, as we got that going during that year that I was privileged to command in Afghanistan as well. Yeah, when you, uh, can you discuss some of those changes uh, that you made when you assumed command there of, of ISAF and U.S. forces in Afghanistan and, and what their impact was? You already mentioned H.R. Uh, McMaster's uh, anti-corruption task force. I know you also did a big review of the rules of engagement as well. So what, what, yeah, what the main changes and stuff? Yeah, go ahead. That was one of the uh, significant actions. There, a number of members of Congress had shared with me uh, that their constituents serving in Afghanistan had written back and felt that their commanders were too restrictive in interpreting the rules of engagement. So it wasn't actually changing the rules. The rules stayed the same. What was happening was because of the enormous emphasis, emphasis understandably, to be sure, uh, but the enormous emphasis on avoiding civilian casualties uh, because the pressure was just increasing from President Karzai. who had been in office for a long time by then through many commanders and this just kept repeating. And it was one of those, can't you guys stop this? And of course it didn't work to go in and say, this is war, mistakes are made in war, we'll try to do better, here's the, what we'll do to try to implement that. Uh, but we continued to make mistakes. We drove that way down. We even brought in the civilian group, I think it was the crisis group or one of the others, um, and brought in a woman from Harvard who in fact had helped us on the counterinsurgency field manual, as you may recall, uh, to do a study of this. But that was a huge issue. Um, and the sense that we wouldn't be there if the troops were in a tough spot was certainly not Stan's intent. But what had happened is the pressure on civilian casualty had resulted in people actually making more difficult um, the application of the rules of engagement. In other words, they were sort of circumscribing how they interpreted it. And it was as if every level below Com ISAF was adding a little bit extra check. And you know, you can't do this until you, the battalion command post has to approve uh, the use of you name it. Uh, and so we went through that and General Rodriguez, who was the three-star operational uh, commander, uh, played a very central role in this. So we sat down a number of cases, brought the sergeant's major in, Sergeant Major Hill, of course, came with me. That was our fourth combat tour together, worked on this, and then laid out, uh, again, here's how to interpret these rules of engagement. And nobody can impose an additional measure uh, below me. And that was the way we, we dealt with that so that our soldiers and Marines and those on the ground understood that if they got in a tough spot, we were going to be there for them. Um, and we did a lot of, uh, again, contingency kinds of uh, uh, wargaming of this uh, for the subordinate commanders to make sure everybody got that. The Afghan local police was a huge initiative because we, that was one where we, you could do the math. Even with the additional forces that were still coming in, uh, they didn't all arrive until about halfway through my time as the commander, late 2010. We, we just couldn't get the density on the ground that was needed. With, we could do, the, we ramped up the Afghan army, uh, special operations forces, commandos, police, their special units and so forth, but there's no way the numbers didn't work. And so what you had to do was take this uh, program that the uh, special forces were just beginning, where they would go into a village, 
it was called Village Stability Operations Program. Uh, and they would establish a location, they'd get to know the villagers. Um, and with that kind of relationship, then with a whole bunch of guidelines that were established in coordination with the Afghan uh, president include because he had to approve this and it took a while to convince him of the necessity of this uh, even though he had wanted to do it three or so years earlier so uh, and so Afghan and they would be underneath the uh, provincial police and there were a bunch of safeguards but most importantly our advisors were there in the form of our special forces even with all the additional special forces going out with in their A-teams or the equivalent for the uh, Marines and uh, and uh, SEALs, we still didn't have enough. And so I actually committed two infantry battalions to these CJ SOTIFs, one in the north, one in the south. In the north, I actually made the lieutenant colonel battalion commander the commander of the CJ SOTIF. I knew him. He'd been my planner uh, in the 82nd Airborne Division. He'd been a star in Iraq, a really tough place during the surge. And here he is as a battalion commander from the 82nd, great unit, and did a spectacular job. But what they did is they broke up these conventional infantry battalions, and you'd break an A team in half and give them an infantry squad. And that meant you could literally double the number of uh, village VSO sites. Uh, and that then meant you could double the number of Afghan local police uh, entities. And it, it, it has challenges. There are lots of ways that this can go wrong. And when you start to pull your presence from them, uh, you can see that. But to achieve what we had to achieve, keep in mind that we knew we were going to have to draw down uh, in the summer of 2011. That had been announced in the speech when uh, the president announced the buildup uh, at West Point a year, actually two and a half years earlier. It, it was in... Uh, uh, late 2009, as I recall. Uh, and so we had to make the progress that we could. And so the focus was had to be on the south first. That was the heartland of the Taliban. It was Kandahar uh, and Helmand, and then some of the other locations, uh, Aruzgan and so forth there. And the idea was to, to push them back in those locations where they were really threatening uh, breaking Route 1, the, the mm -hmm. artery of the country, uh, in many different places. Uh, and that was done. It, we did achieve that. It pushed them all the way out of southern Helmand and so forth. Uh, and there were training camps down there near the Pakistani border, et cetera. And then the idea was that at, over time would shift focus to the east. And that was something we never were quite able to do uh, before we had to start drawing down the surge forces there. Uh, given the timeline that we had. Uh, but there, during that year, did indeed, again, stop the momentum, push it back, uh, accelerate the training of the Afghan forces, develop the transition plan, begin initial transition uh, in certain locations, and of course, keep Al-Qaeda from coming back, which was a huge, that's the overriding mission all the time. Uh, and also, obviously, ensure that that's a good platform from which we could conduct uh, operations in the region as necessary. And of course, publicly well known, uh, the raid that got Osama bin Laden uh, a few months before I left was conducted from eastern Afghanistan by Bill McRaven's forces under the CIA that night uh, rather than under me. Yeah, and you talked about your problems in the east. Um, could Pakistan have done more to help with the effort in Afghanistan? Oh. Certainly it could have. Again, it's easy for me to say, um, if you go tangle with the Haqqani and the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan and Al-Qaeda remnants, and, and you know now it's even the Islamic State has an entity there, and they're already dealing with the Turkey Taliban Pakistani, um, that's just in the federally administered tribal areas. And then, if you want to do something down Baluchistan, again, you can set off an insurrection, uh, an insurgency, and keep in mind that a lot of the natural gas that powers the country comes out of Baluchistan. So, uh, again, it's very easy to say, you know, most academically to say, you know, why aren't they doing more? And it's very frustrating to Admiral Mullen in particular. You may recall that a fairly quotable moment where he said that Akani Network was a 
you know, essentially an entity of the ISI, a wholly owned subsidiary. So I think that was a bit of an overstatement probably, but there certainly was some degree of communication, maybe some degree of support. It's much murkier than that, I can tell you, and keep in mind my final job in government, uh, of course, where we would have had those, as they say, insights uh, into what was going on. And it was not as clear uh, as has been made out sometimes by those who are the critics of, of Pakistan, but certainly could have and ideally should have. The problem there is that they'd mm -hmm. always had, they knew that their biggest existential threat really wasn't India, um, even though that's the focus of much of their army. It's really the internal extremists that are trying to take the country apart internally. And they've never completely had the ability to take them on and, and keep them down. And so it's just constantly reacting to them. And that still continues uh, to this day. Periodically, very impressive oper operations, push them back, disrupt them, degrade them, uh, but never truly destroy them uh, mm -hmm. to the point that they can't reconstitute and come back. You uh, have, have talked about uh, Hamid Karzai a little bit. You know, one of the um, other ways that uh, people say Afghanistan is different than Iraq is in the, the, the great lack of indigenous leadership. That, you know, it's, again, poor education. A lot of, a lot of the potential leaders had been, had been killed or else had left the country. Um, how did you evaluate the Afghan leaders that you dealt with, in particular Karzai? Well, the top level of leadership was really very, very good. Um, you know, President Karzai was exceedingly well educated, uh, very eloquent, um, charismatic, uh, you know, some really impressive qualities. Um, it's what got him that job, uh, after all. Uh, Ashraf Ghani is a world class intellect, um, uh, occasionally so brilliant that, of course, the, the, proposals, the plans are, are pretty sophisticated and intricate, and we would, you know, then sit down and, and, and recognize that perhaps, you know, the most sophisticated plan imaginable for the least, the country least capable of carrying out a sophisticated plan. So we would then work and, but again, that the, the big ideas were, were spectacular. Um, the challenge was, of course, that as in any country, um, the same with Prime Minister Maliki. I mean, I, I would have to tell Prime Minister Maliki that, uh, look, you know, your forces actually aren't as good as you think they are. I mean, the reason there are 53 dead bodies in Baghdad due to violence civilians uh, every 24 hours is because they are not capable of providing security for the people since we have pulled out of the neighborhoods. We have to go back in. We have to retake control. This is difficult. Uh, again, remember, it's their country. He, he was the one who got the, the votes in Parliament, not me. Uh, and the same with, uh, with President Karzai, although that was another source of challenge, which was, of course, the election that had been hung for so, so long. And, uh, and that, there was some friction there as well <clears throat> with um, Ambassador Holbrook was seen, I, I think probably unfairly, but seen as trying to force a second round that became part of the mythology that he and, and Ambassador Eikenberry had done that. And that made, again, that relationship difficult later on, uh, as I realized on arriving in the country. Um, the challenge, I think, with President Karzai is that he'd been in the job uh, by then for quite some time. Uh, keep in mind, he assumed the presidency very early on, has sort of built it, <clears throat> and, and the situation was pretty good in the early years. Um, and then of course it deteriorates, obviously the frustration grows. As I may, may, mentioned, we occasionally made mistakes, his forces would make mistakes. And this kind of frustration, I think, accumulates over time. Um, I felt like we had a very good relationship, actually. We could be uh, honest with each other. Uh, there were a couple of times where I mean, there were really serious issues that had to be dealt with, and Ashraf Ghani actually helped resolve them <clears throat> each time. I mean, these were very, very significant. Um, but we worked through those, and again, it was a year that was progress. And so, as I mentioned, the metrics in 
Afghanistan, of course, are also very different than Iraq because it's not a fighting season all year long, roughly the way it is in Iraq, with maybe the exception in the far north that it gets really cold. Um, you know, you can fight all year in Iraq. And so the metrics are, you know, if you're, they're actually going down, they're not going down because uh, it's the end of the fighting season and beginning of winter or the poppy harvest or the poppy planting or something like that. It's going down because it's really, the violence is actually diminishing. Uh, in Afghanistan, you have to compare year to year because there's a distinct rhythm to the fighting in that country, again, especially uh, given the reduction in the winter, that fighting season, and then it picks back up in the spring when the snow melts <clears throat> and the roads are trafficable again. And you can see little dips again when the poppy's planted and when it's harvest and some other things like that. Um, so you're looking year on year. And for the better part, I think it was something like three quarters of a year, starting in the second half of the time that I was there, all of a sudden we saw a reduction in violence year on year. It was the first time it had happened since the very beginning. Because keep in mind that, you know, it was negligible in the beginning and it had just kept going and going and going again year on year. Um, so that was significant and that helped a great deal. And of course, we had a lot of money during those years and a lot of troops and enablers and all the rest of that. But still, this frustration would come out. And of course, the political situation uh, was quite fraught. Uh, as well. Of course, keep in mind, again, his rival, uh, who was a very significant figure, uh, especially with certain of the tribes and sectarian and uh, ethnic groups, um, really never accepted that he'd been defeated in the election. Of course, this has continued. Uh, that's a, a theme of elections in Afghanistan that they're always disputed. But the, the, you know, these are the challenges. And, you know, you, you, you get the leader that the country elects and you have to work with them and you have to occasionally show the full range of emotions, ideally always acting because if you are no longer acting, you may do something that is, as we say, non-biodegradable and truly ruptures the relationship in a way that renders it, you know, not retrievable. And you have to be very, very conscious of that. Just, uh, I'm putting this out for, uh, for Mike Perry there. Uh, I know we're coming up on our hour and I've got a number of questions I want to pursue and I'm, I know Jennifer Preyas won't mind talking about them. So we're going to keep, continue to go on uh, over, over the hour if that's okay with you. Okay. That's like it is, looks like he is. We're, we're, taking, we're taking control. So okay. Okay. Good. As that's long as you wish. Okay, good. Well, we'll go to, we can go to 7.15, but that probably the audience <laughs> will be falling off by then. Oh, no, this is fascinating stuff. Uh, you've already talked about that the the major achievements you made during your time there. Um, uh, you can highlight them again if you wish, but my, my question is, what more could you have accomplished if you'd gotten all the troops you wanted for the surge and got them for as long as you wanted them? If you'd really gotten the surge that you wanted, what more could you have done? It? Well, that's a big what if. Um, you know, keep in mind that uh, General McChrystal's minimum level uh, in his request was 40,000 American forces. It was something I, I supported, certainly. Uh, I did think that was the minimum. What we got was 30,000 plus Secretary Gates whispering me in the Oval Office, I've got 10% overage so we can go a little higher. We never really got higher because it was just always difficult to, to build the additional forces, but that was good to know. And then they did generate some additional uh, NATO and non-NATO coalition country forces. Um, again, what, I, what it would have been ideal would, of course, been to do the South and more of the East at the same time. It's not to say that we weren't pursuing initiatives uh, in the East, some of which were pursued with uh, some of our other government partners who had various programs out in the East and so forth. And And some of that was launched during this time because we had the additional base structure to support it. Um, but we never really got all the way to the Pakistani border in some of those areas. There were districts in some key provinces that, again, just didn't have the density to, to do what we needed. Um, and then out sort of in the heart of darkness out there where Al-Qaeda had its sanctuary uh, and where, the, where they still want to go back, they're still fighting to get back in there, as is now the Islamic State. 
and uh, northeast of that, uh, very, very rugged, tough terrain. We never could certainly uh, establish control of that. Now, note, you're never going to control that entire country. Uh, arguably, we went a valley or two too far in some of the areas. Uh, as you may recall, there you know some famous outposts that were out there in the Kunar and so forth. Um, and in fact, I remember visiting one of those when I was a Central Command commander and, and actually did go back uh, to Kabul and said, man, I, you know, this, this organization, they're tremendous and really good people. Uh, but all they're doing is protecting themselves. They have really no relationship with the village to speak of. Uh, every logistical resupply effort is either by air or a major combat operation on the ground. Uh, I just sort of wonder, and of course, Stan had already figured that out. And, you know, they were already starting to edge into starting to withdraw some of those, even as we were increasing our forces. You know, there was for a while, um, in fact, it might have been with General Eikenberry when he was uh, the commander, that the insurgency begins where the hard surface road ends. And we all sort of bought into that for a while. Indeed, I probably did in the early parts of my time as CENTCOM commander. But it quickly became, and then and, and Carl agreed with that as well. He said, you know, it just wasn't operative in that those places, some of which it wasn't really even that they were Taliban. They just hated anybody from outside. Uh, sometimes it had to do with um, illegal mining or logging or what have you. They just didn't want government around them. Uh, nonetheless, it would have been great to be able to do more uh, again, in the east, uh, even as we were really focusing in the south and even the southwest, because you had some pieces in Farah <clears throat> there, and in the uh, Italian uh, command, which is a very good organization, I might add, together with the Spaniards and some other elements. The uh, and let's let's talk a little bit more about the the the, the surge and its it, its ending. Um, you know that what was the process that resulted in the the president's decision on the size of the not just the size of the surge but also I know we were surprised a bit by the drawdown and the eventual com complete redeployment of the surge forces. Uh, so how did just describe the the process that led to the president's decision making in those areas? Well, first of all, I have to I don't want to encourage folks typing stuff, but I can't see the motto of my old regiment and not say Rakasan. Um, the, you know, the process for determining the size of the surge and the other components, if you will, but the really it was the big issue was how many additional forces. Um, that was these nine meetings, uh, and again, a very rigorous process that started out with the intelligence situation and quite methodically worked its way through and then started uh, also uh, looking at the different options and, and all the rest of this. And so, again, a very exhaustive process. Uh, and, and a lot of grappling about what is the task and purpose, you know, could we do just a counterterrorism mission? And of course, you have to do counterterrorism operations with counterterrorism forces, that's crucial. But there's such a limit to what they are and, and, and to all the enablers that you have to put on top of them for every one of these incredibly high-risk missions. And about 10 to 15 a night was about the max that we could do. So the idea that you could, quote, increase the counterterrorism component and therefore you wouldn't have to do the rest, it just didn't, didn't uh, pass muster, frankly. In fact, it had been wargamed uh, at the Pentagon. We wargamed several different options. I participated in that. Uh, and, you know, that one was the conclusion about that particular course of action was we cannot accomplish the mission given to us by the president uh, if that is selected. So anyway, 30,000 troops came out. Um, that, the, that announcement was actually shared with us. Uh, the process was done. We were waiting for the president to announce a decision. And it was a Sunday. I was down at McDill Air Force Base as a CENTCOM commander, so I was back from the region. Uh, and I got a call Sunday morning and said, we needed to be in the Oval Office at 5 p.m. tonight. Uh, the president's going to describe the decision that he's made. Uh, you'll be in there with the vice president, national security advisor, SecDef, and chairman of the Joint Chiefs. So, uh, you know, we 
hustled up, got the plane and flew on up there and, and we're in the Oval Office and uh, the president announced and, and discussed this somewhat, said, okay, 30,000 troops. That's when, as I said, Gates leaned over and said, I got, you know, 3,000 more in my pocket. So I'm thinking 33, okay. And then we'll get the rest from NATO. And, and then it was, but I'm also going, I'm deciding that we will start the drawdown uh, in, I think it was July of 2011. And that was actually the first time that that issue was ever raised. And immediately right after that, it was okay. Uh, you okay with that, Joe? This is the vice president, of course, uh, and then went around the room. And so, okay, because again, we had really had not had an opportunity. And then from there, he went down to the situation room and they had Stan and I guess Carl Eikenberry on the VTC and he informed them of his decision as well. And then said, and I'm going to announce all this. Uh, it was either the next night or the night after at a speech to the Corps of Cadets at West Point. Uh, I want you all to be up there. So we flew back home and then flew back up again uh, a night or two later for that speech. And that's how it came about that that, that was inserted into the, the speech as well. Um, look, there's, you know, I think an awful lot of folks in uniform have questioned whether it's helpful to announce a drawdown date because uh, you're basically telling the enemy that you're going to start going home in a speech where you want to show your determination and the additional forces you're going to commit. Again, we can, you know, do the after action review on that uh, quite a bit, certainly. Um, but at the end of the day, what that meant was we really did have an, an end date. Now, we didn't have the actual number that was going to be drawn down. That was decided later the next year. Uh, or actually a year and a half later, this is what I was in command. <clears throat> so I think it was in May or so, or maybe June of uh, 2011. And uh, there were three meetings. And in the first meeting, I came back for it, obviously. And then I was going to have my, had my CIA confirmation hearing right after the end of that. But in the first meeting, I laid out, here are the options. Uh, and, and it was it was an option for how many to draw down immediately and then the duration that it would take to get the remainder of the 30,000 uh, redeployed. And I was really hoping to get a fairly modest number here and then all the way through the second fighting season and not draw down until well into the winter again after the second fighting season. So this whole year, then the next whole year, and then at that winter. Um, so President considered it, discussion around the table uh, with the security, national security team, and then said, okay, take, consider this one. It was a fairly substantially larger initial drawdown and then a shorter time frame. I think it maybe the spring of the following year. So you just get this fighting season and then, um, and so that set that back. By the way, none of this ever leaked during that process either, which is really uh, important given that as you may recall, I think Stan McChrystal's plan had leaked. We don't believe from uniform, but um, be that as it may, that was a real challenge. So I had a very small team um, and called directly to the individual back in Afghanistan who had the team of planners. They drilled it. Uh, we did some more work. Of course, I was doing calls on the Hill preparatory for the uh, hearing uh, with the intelligence committee for the CIA position. Um, had another meeting uh, again a few days later, came back and essentially said, well, here's, here's our analysis. We cannot accomplish the mission if it's actually that, that much and that quick. Um, and more discussion and so forth, back and forth. And then there was a third meeting um, in which uh, it was a, not as small as I'd recommended, um, uh, so a bit bigger, not huge, that was going to come out right away. And then it would get into late summer-ish, and it was sort of, you know, not precise. The problem with that was, so two summers later, um, the problem with that is, as you well know, if you're going to be out by a certain date, especially in Afghanistan, where you've got to really pack everything up and they have to go out the Khyber Pass or out uh, the one through uh, Kandahar, if you're gonna be out by then, you have to start filling in sandbags, you know, 
three months prior or something like that. So it, it took away from that second fighting season. Now, let me point out something, though, that I laid out to the president, literally the, when he asked me to take the job that in the very beginning, after saying yes, obviously the answer, the only answer to a question like, I need you to be the commander of uh, ISAF in Afghanistan uh, is the only answer to that question can be yes. But I want you to know that when I provide advice and courses of action and so forth, they're going to be based on the facts on the ground and the mission that you have assigned us, which we've already discussed a lot and we'll have more discussion about, um, with an awareness informed by all of the other issues with which you have to deal. Essentially, the opportunity cost of having forces in Afghanistan vice in uh, the rebalance to Asia or strain on the force or op-tempo or uh, budget deficits, were, which were an issue, or politics domestically, Capitol Hill coalition. These are legitimate issues that a president uniquely uh, has to consider and rightly should and does consider. Uh, and I said, I'm aware of that. Uh, but it'll be driven by the facts on the ground. And interestingly, in that third meeting, and I reiterated that in the first meeting, I said, I want to remind and share with the others what I shared with the president. So we're in the third meeting, and they said, okay, well, what's your recommendation? And I said, well, um, look, number one, we'll fully support the decision that you make, do everything we can to, to uh, achieve progress with that. But there's been no change in the facts on the ground over the last week, so therefore the uh, course of action that I recommend uh, remains the same. So, um, and, you know, I said in that meeting, um, I'll be asked this tomorrow in the CIA confirmation hearing. And just so you all know, what I'm, I'm sure the Republican ranking member is going to ask, what was your best professional military advice on the drawdown in Afghanistan? Because remember, you swear that you'll tell them that if they ever ask you, and they do, uh, in your confirmation hearing for the position you're in. And I said, I will state that uh, we fully support the president's decision. Um, obviously, do everything we can uh, to achieve our mission, uh, but it is a more aggressive formulation of the drawdown. So that's how that process worked out. But for any of the, you know, the future uh, leaders who literally might be in that situation, I think it's pretty important to have in your mind uh, essentially what the big ideas are about how you are going to provide advice and what is the basis for that. Because it's very easy to go down the path uh, of saying, well, but I know this is politically infeasible or this is unaffordable or what And again, it can't be outrageous. You can't, it has to be realistic. But it should be driven by military considerations, driven by those informed by these others. And I just as an aside, at one point in the process with Iraq, where I made a recommendation to President Bush, uh, and uh, a question was asked of another military commander that was in that particular meeting, not the chairman, um, you know, what do you think of this? And, and he said, well, I'm not sure it'll play well on Capitol Hill. He said, well, thanks, that's, that's my purview. I wanna know what you, so it sort of validated again, I think the kind of approach that I'm describing here as opposed to trying to, again, figure out, will they like what I offer, or, you know, will it sell well on Main Street or Capitol Hill or what have you? Okay, uh, we're about, as a closing, closing question. Okay. Uh, which I'm gonna make it a two-parter, but this will be the last one. Um, the current tenuous peace plan with the Taliban already seems to be in trouble. Um, so I guess that the first one is, what should we do now in Afghanistan? And then the overall thing is, what do we, what should we learn from this whole two decades in Afghanistan? Well, I mean, you've seen, I've published in uh, Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal just this year alone uh, on the agreement that has been evolving and gradually uh, being shared with us, keeping in mind that there are two annexes that have only been shared with the Taliban, uh, not with, with us. Um, and my bottom line has been that we should have a strategy to stay, not a strategy to leave, but that strategy to stay should, the big idea here should be to have a sustained commitment, because that's clearly what's going to be required, that is sustainable. And sustainability is measured in blood and treasure. And, you know, in my view, 
a superpower can certainly maintain 8,600 or whatever the number is now, could maintain 12,000 uh, with some several thousand coalition and so forth and a variety of enablers and all the rest of this, if they're properly configured and uh, aggressive use of contractors and so forth, that's very affordable. And, and, and keep in mind, again, yes, we're still taking casualties. And yes, every one of those is a tragedy, but they're so reduced um, over the years of the really tough, tough war that was going on. And the Afghan forces are the ones who are out there fighting for their country um, and quite courageously and, and, and selflessly and taking tough casualties. So it seems to me that would, and by the way, if you actually want the enemy to come to the table and truly negotiate, um, it seems to me that they, they should think that you're going to stay and unless they actually present something that is sufficiently attractive that you will leave with some verifiable uh, conditions and snapback and all the rest of this, uh, not all of which is apparent to me in this uh, particular proposal. Uh, and of course, predictably, you know, the Taliban says, well, we didn't do this attack, we didn't do that attack. I mean, violence has been quite trouble, troubling. Um, and so even that measure of reducing the violence, at the very least, they have a very different interpretation uh, of what that means from what those who uh, signed that agreement uh, believed it meant, I believe. Um, you know, what should we learn? I think Again, it's always about big ideas. And I think here, the biggest takeaway is that you just cannot afford to have all these years before you actually get the inputs right. Um, again, go back to the problems with the command structure, the determination not to plant a flag, then what we have to, then, so it's a grudging commitment all the way. Of course, you know, I'm to blame to a degree because, you know, there I was in Iraq as a three-star and a four-star, you know, demanding more forces and all the rest of that. And that's why Afghanistan became the war, you know, where we did what we could rather than what we must. Um, but clearly, I think that's the biggest issue. And it took us far too long to get them right. And then we really only had them truly right for, you know, a six or so month period until we had to begin the drawdown uh, and then gradually uh, the glide slope to drawing down the surge forces uh, that were sent. So I think that's the big takeaway here. Um, clearly, you can also, you know, ask at an even higher level uh, to assess the situation and uh, figure out what you intend to actually do, because we, that sort of evolved as well, uh, obviously. But keep in mind, this is right after the 9-11 attacks. We actually thought there was something else coming. I was engaged in something in Bosnia that gave me very good insight into what uh, the JSOC component was, was had on its intel. It's publicly known that the first CT operation actually after 9-11 was actually not into Afghanistan, it was in Sarajevo. Um, and so again, um, lots of lessons there, I think, uh, that really bear studying. And for what it's worth, uh, maybe another lesson is that, and that is, don't throw out all the lessons that we learned in Iraq and Afghanistan and now are learning and still are learning there because we've evolved enormously. I mean, what the commanders that have followed have figured out a way to have sustained commitments with much lower levels of forces because of the armada of drones and the ability to crunch, uh, to integrate massive amounts of data uh, and the precision strike and all of these capabilities that are online now that weren't even available. Uh, as late as the surge in Iraq until really toward the end of that and, and not remotely what they are right now. We need to retain these lessons. Yes, there is a focus, rightly so, a transition to a focus on uh, the potential in an era of resurgent uh, great, great power rivalries. Um, that has to be uh, where the emphasis is. But again, these actually are ongoing they're going to continue to, to be ongoing because extremists do exploit any ungoverned space and, and the Islamist extremists will exploit any ungoverned space in the Middle East and, and other areas where this is predominant. You have to do something about it because what happens there doesn't stay there. U US usually has to lead but needs to be a coalition and it's because we have so many more assets 
now that all of our partners put together. I think if you add up the number of lines of drones of unblinking eyes, it's five or six times all the rest. Uh, and only a few will shoot from those platforms. Uh, and then a recognition that you can't counter terrorists with just counter terrorist force operations. You have to have uh, essentially a comprehensive integrated civil military campaign plan, uh, counterinsurgency campaign plan, but without us doing all of that, because we know now that we require a sustained commitment, it has to be sustainable. So I, I think those are the broader lessons that we should take in addition to the specific lessons on Afghanistan. And with that, Con, let me thank you once again for being such a great classmate. Uh, thanks, Mike. Clearly all that we have ever achieved in life uh, is because of our four years uh, where we were privileged to be together with the members of the Pride of the Corps 74.